Hello and welcome to today's meeting of Democrats of Greater Tucson, every Monday at noon uh, on your broadcast uh, screen. Uh, my name is Larry Bodine and I will be your host today. And our guest is Domingo de Grazia, uh, member of the House of Representatives in District 10. How's it going today for you? Oh, it's going great. I'm uh, really happy to be here. I'm a little sad that we're not actually uh, having lunch together, but uh, yeah, it's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. So I want to send a shout out on behalf of uh, Sammy Saidi, who is the owner of the Kettle Restaurant, where we would ordinarily be meeting. Um, we want to be able to go back there once, once we resume in-person meetings, so I highly encourage everybody to drive down there and order a meal and let's keep uh, the kettle in business. It's right down there at 22nd Street and I-10. And so with that, uh, let me tell you about Domingo de Grazia. He is a Democratic legislature, a legislator in the Arizona House of Representatives in just L LD10. He was first elected in 2018 and he's the youngest son of the artist Ted de Grazia. And his family has lived in Arizona for more than 100 years. Uh, Domingo has three top issues he's going to talk about. One is fighting for Arizona families through fully funded education. Another is passing consumer and biometric data privacy laws. And the third is cleaning up government. And you can go on the DGT website and there's more information about Domingo as well as uh, how you can find his website and uh, his Facebook page. And with that, Domingo, uh, tell our audience why we should all vote for you. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Larry. And uh, hello to the Democrats of Greater Tucson. Like I said, it's been a very long time since I've had lunch with most of you, and I'm really looking forward to, uh, to sitting down with you again. It's been the last few years being in legislature uh, have been incredibly busy, um, but I, I do love touching base with you and um, hearing what's on your mind. I hope that you are all safe and that you are staying healthy and uh, to the extent that you need to, separating yourselves from uh, from people during this COVID-19 crisis. Um, once again, my name is Domingo de Grazia. I am running for re-election to the Arizona House of Representatives in District 10. Now, the, the way that uh, we'll run today is I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how I got into politics, what my priorities are. And after a few minutes of um, giving my background, I encourage you all to jump in with any questions that you might have on any topic that has to do with politics. And uh, we'll get to those questions. I'll tell you about my priorities, but whatever is on your mind, um, feel free to, um, to let me know. So um, right now, I'm gonna show you this is me, fancy logo, and some contact information should you need to or want to reach out, we have both a website, DeGrazia for Arizona, and uh, email at DeGrazia4Arizona.com, as well as Facebook and Twitter. So I will get back to uh, letting you all see my smiling face here. So as you know, um, I'm a Tucson native. My dad was the artist, Ted DeGrazia, and my mom was a teacher um, right here in Tucson and up on the San Carlos Indian Reservation. Now, my dad's family immigrated here from Italy, like in the eight, late 1890s. They settled in uh, Marinci, the mining town, which back then it was called Clifton. Um, my mom, as I said, was a special education teacher, and uh, she taught on the res at San Carlos. Both my mom and my dad got their, uh, their college degrees from the U of A, so go cats. Um, I grew up in Tucson, attending our great public schools out on the west side of town. I went to Pima College for a couple of years before getting a bachelor's and a master's from Embry-Riddle. And then I went on to law school out in Oklahoma. And after law school, I came back to Tucson. I've been representing uh, kids and families in Tucson ever since. It's been about 15 years now. Um, so my work as an attorney has been focused on helping individuals, helping kids, helping families. Um, I never really, I did some corporate work. I did some uh, prosecution. I did some um, corporate business litigation, but largely it's been on just helping individuals. Early on in my legal career is when I really started looking at um, statutes, and this was kind of the beginning of my, my walk into the world of politics, because statutes are the laws of Arizona. And early on, I realized that our laws, there's a lot of bad ones and a lot of, a lot of laws that really hurt families. And so what I did 
probably within my first year of being a lawyer, I started kind of taking the, the statutes apart, literally looking at them bit by bit to see how the, each individual statute um, was composed, what the legislative history of it was, and how it could be changed, modified to make it work better for Arizonans. Um, and that really led me through the probably the first five, seven years of my legal practice was digging through statutes, trying to find out what the, the history was, what the legislators were thinking when they passed a particular law. And this is both state and federal. Um, but I always had kind of a yearning to, to be more helpful. And when you're a trial lawyer, you're helping generally one family at a time. But I wanted to be a little bit more broad based. So I started looking at doing appellate work, which is even more in depth in the uh, in the world of legislative history, in the world of composition, and in the world of, of rewriting statutes, so you can make suggestions on how they could be better. And that is um, the the appellate world because those cases have a bigger impact on Arizonans because the case law is really for all Arizonans rather than just in one uh, single courtroom. Um, so that's where I really honed my legal research, my legal analysis, my statutory analysis, my rule preparation, um, and honed all of my, sk my skills. So that led us up to about 2015, where we had kind of an unpleasant surprise. And that was a guy named Trump that was talking about running for president. And he was talking about the ways in which he wanted to roll back some of our social protections, the ways that we, he wanted to change the composition of the U.S. Supreme Court to get different laws made. Um, that made me incredibly nervous. And of course, when we got to 2016 and that election happened, that was the point at which I had to make a decision on um, how I was going to help Arizonans. Now, I know what happens when you have uh, bad laws. I know what happens when you have a a court system that is leaning a certain way or deciding cases a certain way. So in 2016, I had to make a choice in how I wanted to help. At that time, my stepdaughters were about to graduate high school and they were just really too young to know how to protect themselves. And what I was really fearful of was that, say 10 years after the 2016 election, if they had come back to me and said, you knew that these bad things were going to happen, what did you do about it at that time? Um, I wanted to be able to say, yes, I, I jumped into the fight and I did as much as I could to help. So in order to fight for Arizonans, I did a, an analysis of my skill set, of my knowledge base, and running for the Arizona House of Representatives was the best way that I could fit in and help. Um, so by early 2017, I was in the race. I was running for Legislative District 10 to take the seat back from the Republican that occupied it. Um, and my, you know, my platform is now as it was then, which reflects my values and my knowledge, fighting for Arizona families and fighting for justice for everyone. And I want to, uh, I want to thank all of you that jumped into that fight with me. We won, we got the seat back. Um, it's an extraordinary win and we are certainly on the right track. It, it, the, the importance of, um, of your help and your faith in me has, uh, it's, it's something that I carry with me all the time. Every vote that I cast at the Capitol, every time, literally every time I push the button, um, I remember what it means to cast a vote for Tucson and the, the weight that each vote carries. I am proud of my voting record and I stand behind every vote that I have made. Um, and I'm honored to represent you. And that began really my, my time in legislature closed out the, the first part of the story, which is, what got me into politics and started up another chapter in my life as far as um, learning about how politics works, learning the culture of the capital and being as effective as I could be, le leveraging my legal knowledge, leveraging my, um, my legislative or my statutory skill set and my ability to get into mediation and negotiation. Um, and there were some interesting, interesting things that I saw while I was at the Capitol. The first thing that I noticed right away is that there are some folks at the Capitol that when they talk about um, bills, they make stories up. They just make up things. And you can kind of tell, you know, being a, an attorney, um, I've had a lot of people on the witness stand and I've been able to kind of parse out what makes sense and what stories don't. 
And the, the interesting thing is that there are some folks that just say whatever sounds right and they don't have any backing for it. And I want to change that. Another thing that was really shocking about being in the legislature is that even though the composition of the Arizona House of Representatives is 49% Democrat and 51% Republican, 94% of the bills that make it to the floor are Republican bills. So there is not an equal um, number of bills getting to the floor and it's not an equal representation. Um, what I've done over the last two years is I've looked at the, the players in, at the Capitol. Um, who does what? Who talks to who? How do they get their own agendas through? And that's just a matter of learning um, what that place is all about. Now, I've been assigned to the committees on judiciary with Representative Engel, also from LD10. It's been a fantastic experience. I'm also on the committees for government and for rules. And recently I was um, put on a special uh, committee for ethics for an investigation that's going on. Now, um, all, of these, uh, all of these things that I learned have brought me back to one place that um, it's a choice that we need to be in the fight again, running for election again, um, to get Arizona on the right track. We've had some great success over the last two years. I've actually got four bills out of committee and ready for rules. And um, we've stopped some really, really bad bills by some great teamwork by the uh, Judiciary Committee. So I'm excited about that. Um, and in my choice now is that I need to be running for re-election. So I'm happy to say I'm on the ballot. We are ready to go. I have a great campaign team. Um, I know my legislative history. I know the statutory history. I know how the place runs now. So I'm, I am in the fight and I'm ready to hit the ground running. And we have a lot of work to do at the Capitol, um, especially now that COVID-19 has come through our communities and just wreaked so much havoc on everyone. Uh, we have to make sure that everyone is number one safe and that we all have food, a place to live, that we have a safe job to go to so that we can have income, that workers are protected, that the consumers are protected. Um, all of these things are gonna be priorities on top of all of our regular priorities, which is uh, funding, fully funding public education. We have to make sure that that's in place because that's going to affect generations to come. Uh, we know that women's rights, water issues, the environment, uh, common sense gun laws, criminal justice reform. I was on the um, earned release credits committee over this past summer. We have to be working to make sure that everything is equitable. Um, these are all issues that we have to fight for. There's a lot yet to do. I'm ready to be back in the fight uh, at the Capitol. I'm ready to be back up there for another two years. I am asking for your support and I'm asking for your vote and I'm asking that you join me in this fight. Um, now, we're going to open it up to questions. Anybody that has a question about what's going on at the Capitol, everything from procedure to substance, anything that uh, you might like to hear about. I, If I don't see any questions pop up, I'm just going to kind of ramble on about uh, what well, actually, I'm working on. Um, well, let's get back to what you're working on, but we do have a question from uh, uh, Lucy who asks, in addition to the Arizona Education Association, who are some of your other endorsements? Um, so that's a great question. I am uh, endorsed by the Planned Parenthood and uh, the, the Sierra Club. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm excited about all three now. Um, those, are, those are what you call um, endorsements from major uh, groups, major committees. And uh, it's an honor that they recognize my work and my voting history and my values and um, that they would endorse me. It's, it's really an honor. But um, as well, I've got some, the, the Tucson community that voted for me, um, that's been, that I've been working with, that's behind me now. Those are also, I count, uh, amongst the, the endorsements that I'm honored to have. So thank you. We should see more endorsements coming online. It seems like about every week. We're, we're in the, um, the application phase right now where you fill out a bunch of questions, you go through interviews, you talk to folks. And if they endorse you, they, they send out an email and let you know. So those should be coming online soon. So keep an eye out for endorsements. Um, and that's, that's a great point. Um, education funding, we were just getting to the point where um, we were making some headway in the budget with having educators um, paid what they should be paid, what they're worth. And it's, it's not just education. Um, the educators themselves, but we have huge needs as far as our education infrastructure. So as we look at how the budget is going to affect 
um, our, how COVID has affected our budget, we have to be thinking about how we're going to um, make sure that education is fully funded. And one of the ways that, that I would like to approach this is reducing our cost for our prison population. We have in Arizona a, a prison system, a criminal justice system that is $1.1 billion with a B. Now, if we can eliminate the folks from our criminal justice system that are, um, that are suitable for being released, that are within a certain bracket that they can be released into the community, that, they can, that can be done safely, and we can reduce our overall prison population, we can save that money right, right back into education. And that's one of the things I'm working on. Um, we looked at it a little bit with the Earned Release Credits Committee, but also working with representatives um, Engel and Rodriguez, they're on judiciary with me. Um, that's one of the, the tasks that we're trying to tackle. Now that doesn't even get into what's happening in the prison system right now with COVID-19, which is a huge concern. We've been on Zoom calls for um, since late March trying to figure out how to keep um, inmates safe because they are, they are not free to leave, obviously, and uh, they need the, the protection of the state. That's the environment that they're in, so we have an obligation to them. So um, that's two components that we're looking for. Um, now, me personally, I've got a handful of bills that are going to be coming up pretty soon um, at the beginning of next session. I'm, I've already got drafted bills on consumer data privacy. And what this touches on is when you use the internet, when you use your phone's internet, um, when you do any kind of web browsing, there is data that's uh, transmitted usually off to advertisers. And the advertisers collect that data, they build a profile on you and that information gets sold off to other advertisers. So talking about how we protect our own data is going to be a, a huge topic. It's, it's going to be secondary to protecting Arizonans from COVID and making sure that Arizonans have what they need to get through the COVID crisis. But it's something that uh, I've got the bills drafted now, I've already done the research, so those are ready to go for, for discussion. And both the, uh, uh, the data protection bill and the uh, biometrics bill did make it out of their underlying committees in 2020. So I'm looking forward to pushing those through again. Um, I've got, also... uh, got another question for you here on uh, gun safety. Christina would like to know if you could describe your position on gun safety and gun control. Yeah, thank you, Christina, for that question. Um, I believe that we can have both uh, gun ownership and gun safety, common sense gun laws. Um, some of the, the, so we'll start top down as far as where we are in Arizona as far as gun laws. Now we have the, um, the second amendment to the US Constitution that says that you can, um, you can own and possess firearms. But remember that article three of the US Constitution also sets up the courts whose job it is to interpret those, the, the constitutional provisions. And the courts have said that we do have a, a need for reasonable limits on gun ownership. So I support the Second Amendment. I support the idea that uh, folks can have guns, but we also have to have some reasonable limits on that. And we already know that there are. You can't take a weapon into, say, an airport. Um, if you are a convicted felon, you're going to lose certain rights. So we already have some limitations on there. What I would like to see it is uh, morphed into a way where um, the owners, the gun owners that are already doing the responsible things, locking up guns, making sure that they are not able to be reached by children, making sure that gun owners um, have the training they need to be safe. These are all ideas that uh, a lot of the community already supports and a lot of gun owners already support. And I think we could implement them relatively quickly and um, make our community safer because gun violence is, it's, it's a huge problem. And um, we're losing our, our neighbors daily to, to gun violence and it's something that we need to address. Now, um, on that issue, I don't have any bills, but what I do have is uh, Dr. Freeze has drafted bills and submitted them over the last probably five years. I've signed on to his bills and I've been in full support of them, which is, it's one of the nice things about the legislature that in, in our Democratic caucus, we have, um, we have little pods or little specializations where folks have a specialization like Dr. Freeze on gun control or um, Representative Cano on housing or Representative Engel has a good background on environment and um, criminal justice. So you look to each individual that has a specialization, when they write bills, you sign on to it. I think I signed on to about 84 bills 
this uh, this legislative session in uh, in 2020, and that's how we divide up the workload and and really get a um, a great speed as far as what we can accomplish in in bill research and bill drafting, and that kind of ties into. One of my, the other priorities that I have is um, it's cleaning up our government, cleaning up the way that it works. And I see that um, we've had some, some questions that have touched on what the legislature is doing and what we're, what we're about to be doing. Now, the, the legislature is being called back into session, so we'll be going back in uh, starting tomorrow. The Rules Committee has already had a hearing today to get some bills to the floor. And what I would like to see, though, is the there's a fundamental premise in Arizona that is written into our constitution and it's the idea that all power all political power in Arizona is derived from the people and that political power as it is um, left out to the governor to the legislature that is that is done with the consent of the people so the power flows from every constituent and it's with the consent of each or the consent of each constituent. Um, and what you might be seeing this week is is a process by which there will be limited public at hearings. And, and what I mean by that is committee hearings. Because of COVID-19, the um, the rules that we have now in place or the, the statement that I heard just this morning is that everyone is going to be wearing masks. We're going to be social distancing, but there's going to be limited public participation. And that is something that I believe is fundamentally unfair. I believe that Arizonans have a right to be part of the discussion. And this is, you've heard me talk about this with the, um, the ability that you have to go online and look up bills and leave your remarks or request to speak. That's the, the RTS system, the request to speak system. But with COVID-19, that's being severely limited. So I want to make sure that we have a process by which uh, the right of Arizonans to be heard in committee cannot be um, it, it cannot be undone. It cannot be limited. Unfortunately, um, I, I don't yet have the, uh, the ability, the power, the capacity to do that, um, but I will certainly advocate for all of you. And what I would also like to see is that if a legislator is speaking on the floor of the House about a particular bill, I would love to have the ability to call for something that, that I call um, foundation. You simply say, I would request that this legislator give us the background of why they believe what they believe. And if someone just has a belief about a particular topic, I'm okay with that. But if they, if they phrase it in a way that sounds like they have some type of uh, research or science or data to back them up, I want to know what that is. So I want legislators to be transparent about what they say to be transparent about where they're getting their motivation from. If it's just a belief, I'm okay with that. But if you say that you have some justification, I really want Arizonans to know it. Um, and that also goes to a, uh, a topic that I think we're going to skip to, which is um, a seven bill limit and making sure that there's a limit on the, um, the number of bills that lobbyists can, can put forth. And Larry, did we have another question? Uh, yes, we did. Um... Marion would like to know, how do you rate the governor's handling of the virus crisis in Arizona? You know, pretty much everything is open now. You know, you can go to restaurants and gyms and all places where you can be in close contact with people. Um, how do you feel that the governor handled this? That's a, that's a great question. And um, it's something that we're dealing with uh, on probably seven Zoom calls a week. Um, the governor, I, I think he's done too little and it's been too late and we're opening too soon. And I base that on the data that I've been tracking off of the uh, Arizona Department of Health Services website, which you can just hit that website, go to the COVID-19 information and look up the, the two pieces that I've been following are the number of cases in Arizona and the number of deaths. And the number of cases in Arizona keeps climbing. The, the number of deaths is it appears to be leveling out, but it is certainly not declined. And my concern comes from the fact of the rate of spread of COVID-19. And I believe that all Arizonans need to be taking self-protective measures, understanding what COVID-19 is, understanding how it spreads, and understanding what you have to do to protect yourself. Because 
I, I think the governor has, um, he's essentially called hands off and he said that opening the economy is of higher importance than keeping people safe. Um, so what we know is that with, with certain um, viral infections, there's a, an infection rate. One person can infect a certain number of others. Generally with the flu, I believe it's somewhere around um, each infected person can infect like maybe 2.5 others. Uh, with COVID, it's higher. It's like six to eight others. So uh, please understand the way that the virus spreads. The virus does not spread by itself. The virus is spread by people. And that's either through uh, touching some surface that has the, the viral particles on it and then touching eyes, nose, mouth, or through inhaling particles that um, from an infected person. So social distancing, wear a mask, and make sure that you, you keep an eye on um, exposure times to other people. It's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a graph that you could almost chart out. If you have good social distance, then you don't have to worry so much about exposure time. But if you're near someone and they might be, um, they might be sick, then you have to have a mask on and keep an eye on your exposure time to them. So these are basic principles. The, what we're working on right now, literally right now, is I'm working on a bill. Um, it's gonna be in the form of, of an amendment that comes up this week that will give um, a little bit of comfort to businesses that need to open up. They wanna open up, but they wanna do it safely. I've been talking to a lot of businesses that say, hey, I just, I wanna do this right. We want to get back into business and open our doors, but we don't want anybody to get hurt. And that's, that's something that we can entirely do with the, the knowledge and information that we have about COVID, if we all protect ourselves and, and take protective measures, we can open up, we can get back to some form of normalcy. So my bill, the, the proposal is that a business that follows CDC guidelines, um, OSHA guidelines, um, um, HHS guidelines or AZDHS guidelines um, will be presumed to have met a reasonable standard of care so they don't have to worry so much about being sued just out of the blue, which we haven't seen that as um, a topic that's coming up yet. Um, but there are some businesses worried about that and they just want to keep folks safe. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep everybody safe and get our economy back on track. So that's um, one of the bills that you should see coming up, hopefully either on the floor as an amendment or in one of the committees this coming week, literally within the next maybe 96 hours. Um, all right, we've got a, a good question from Lance. Uh, okay. He says that uh, being that the Republican majority in Arizona, in the Arizona House is so thin, do you have any thoughts on which districts are liable to flip to Democratic? And have you, uh, and do you endorse any other candidates? Um, that's a great question. And, and we've certainly been keeping an eye on, um, on all the districts. Now, there's two components to this. There's, because the, it's a 29-31 split in the House of Representatives, 29 Dems to 31 Republicans. What we would need to capture the House is to hold all the Democratic seats that we have and then pick up at least two or three more. And I believe there are three districts. Uh, if, if my campaign manager, Nick, is on, he can give us a, a few of the better details on that. I but can. there are some districts that are ready to be flipped. They were close last time. They're going to be close this time. Um, I've learned from some of my predecessors that uh, endorsements are, they're a little bit tricky. Generally, we wait till after the primary um, just to kind of stay out of the, the political fray, but I will turn it over to Nick to give you the, uh, the rundown on which districts are flippable. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so the three for the house that we're looking at are actually LD6, LD, which is up in Flagstaff, Coconino County, uh, LD20, and LD21, actually. In LD6, we have Coral Evans, who is the current mayor of Flagstaff running, and we're actually able to single shot there. So we're really hopeful that we can uh, take one of those house seats. We also have Felicia French, who got pretty close running for the state house in LD6 in 2018. She's now running for the state senate. And actually, Sylvia Allen, the current state senator up there, has a pretty tough uh, primary from a very aggressive Trump Republican. So we're hoping that she'll get a little dinged up in that primary, and then Felicia might be able to take that Senate seat. Uh, but in LD20, we've also gotten increasingly close in the last few cycles. We have uh, Judy Schwiebert running for the state house up there, I believe. Uh, and then Doug Irvin is running for the state Senate. Uh, and then finally, uh, LD21 is not something that would normally come up as a target, but we actually have Kathy Connect, who, sorry, I keep looking over, I have a list on my other screen. Um, Kathy Connect, who actually ran as an independent in uh, LD20 in 21 in 2018 and got very, very close to that state Senate seat. 
Uh, and so she's actually now running as a Democrat. So we're able to support her. Some of the Democratic groups like Arizona List are able to support her. So we are a little hopeful about that. Uh, and then just last thing, uh, Christine Porter Marsh for the state Senate and LD28. That one is basically ours to lose. She was within 300 votes of flipping that seat last year. So those are the six uh, races that we're really looking at. Coral Evans and LD6, Judy Schwebert and LD20, uh, Kathy Connect and LD21, uh, Felicia French and LD6, Christine Porter Marsh and LD28, and Doug Irvin in LD20. All right, thank you, Nick. That's uh, great information there. Um, yeah, so it, remember that to holding the seats that we have now, picking up a few extra seats, and then we can really start the, the the process of getting Arizona back on the right track. And that's what that's going to look like. In, assuming that we take the house, we have, like I said, a, a list of bills that are ready to go. They've already been drafted. They've already been um, worked through. They've already been vetted. So they are ready to go. Um, and we can start getting back to uh, protecting Arizonans. And, and it's going to be, it's going to be interesting what happens after the 2020 election, depending on the Senate in terms of negotiating with the governor. Um, but I am, like I said, I'm, I'm fully ready to go. I believe that I know the players now. I know what their motivations are. Um, and I know what levers to pull to, to make things happen. So um, we're, we're hitting the ground running here. Now, um, some of the topics that have been coming up recently that are also tied to COVID-19 that might be of interest to you, the um, unemployment insurance and the pandemic unemployment insurance. The, the DES system that we had in place, the computer system, um, those of you who went to Pima College back when I did, like in the, in the early 90s, you were probably programming on a programming language like um, COBOL or Fortran, something like that. That's not too far away from uh, what DES has, but they just rolled out uh, the 13th of this month, they just rolled out their new program um, where folks can more easily access their information, get their their weekly statements in to um, to get their unemployment checks, and we're working at ways to have more uh, more federal money drawn down to Arizonans because things like rent are still really really tight. I know the economy is opening up, but we still have to protect ourselves, and there are a lot of folks that are not comfortable with going back to work yet. Um, that's going to tie into as well um, the idea of contact tracing. Now, AZDHS has a, uh, a protocol in place where they're hiring folks to figure out who's sick and help those folks know what they should do to keep from getting others sick. And then as well, um, making sure that the, the general public doesn't get exposure. Now, contact tracing is coming up in the federal side as well. There's a uh, house bill, I believe it's uh, 6666, that would have more money for COVID-19 prevention and some contact tracing there. Um, so that's going to be rolling through. The One of the other hot topics right now is voting rights and how we're going to handle voting rights and um, whether it should be something that we go to an all-mail ballot. This was an idea that came up at the end of our, our legislative session before we recessed in March. I was getting emails from a lot of our um, elected elections um, commissions or officials from different counties, and they were saying, because of the COVID pandemic, we need to get ahead of this and have the ability to go to an all-mail ballot. And what happened is I ran an amendment, I had an amendment ready to go, I'll say, that would, during the declaration of an emergency due to a public health crisis like COVID-19, that county recorders or the election officials could go to an all mail ballot. And um, I had it drafted, it was ready to go. It was submitted as an amendment. There was a huge political fray and we weren't even allowed to um, submit that amendment. So it never got heard. Um, but what you can do if you are not on Pebble, the permanent early voting list, please go and sign up for the permanent early voting list. There's something like 70 to 80% of Arizonans are already on it. So going to all mail ballots is really, um, it's really not that big a thing. And what we can do is keep the polling stations open, but also have um, mail ballots. It should give, be a good compromise for everybody and, um, and really get both sides of that going. But we need to, like I said, number one is protect people. Um, the the other issues that we're going to be seeing um, that are directly they they were issues before and they're going to be coming up again is um, housing making sure that folks can just pay their rent right now there was a lot of work that I did with the judiciary committee 
on um, making sure that evictions were stopped. We have a good crew of constables in Tucson that are working with folks to make sure that folks know what their, their rights are as far as evictions. The governor had put a stay on evictions proceedings, not necessarily um, stopping the evictions themselves, but the evictions proceedings. And we spent weeks and weeks talking to the courts, trying to get um, information out to, to people who are about to lose their housing about what their rights were. So I think we're finally getting that solved. That doesn't solve the underlying issue that we have on, um, on housing, affordable housing. This has been a huge issue in Arizona for a very long time and COVID-19 is really, really exposing um, that deficiency that we had as well as all the other deficiencies. Um, so those are, I think the hot topics that are coming up. Um, we're working with a lot of the, along the lines of um, letting businesses open and having them do it safely. The employee component of that is something that I've been really focusing on to make sure that employees are safe in their workspace because they, a lot of times you don't, you don't have a choice. If you need money, you have to go back to work. Um, and unfortunately the, the U S as a whole, I think we've just not had, um, Folks haven't had savings. They were living paycheck to paycheck before this. And that really kind of, it really borne out when um, COVID-19 hit, businesses were shuttered and people had like a week's worth of money in their pocket. Um, so protecting workers is is the one of the key components of probably over the next six weeks. And I believe that we're gonna go into special session to look at COVID-19 specific uh, legislation. Although I'm hearing a rumor that um, some of the Republicans are not interested in buying into the uh, the governor's, um, I guess his plan to go into special session. Remember that the governor would have to call a special session after both in the House and Senate sine die. Um, so it, it's it's anybody's guess right now what's going to happen. We see a lot of fracturing in the uh, House and the Senate Republican side about what they want to do um, with COVID nineteen. Um, there's Everything from folks that say that uh, there is no virus to folks that say we should not be in session because the virus is spreading. So um, there's a lot of opinions out there. Not a lot of them are based on data. Um, if you have any questions about the data or about masks or about um, how to better protect yourself, I can certainly share with you what I know and I'm happy to do that. I can certainly share with you the, uh, the links that I have to the virologists and immunologists that have been opining on these issues. Uh, I've got a question uh, from Lillian who wants, uh, who, it's a follow-up on your earlier discussion about keeping our data safe on the internet. What is your position on Facebook? Facebook is notorious for abusing personal information. Yes, they are. And I, Lillian, I appreciate that, that question. So remember that uh, there's an old saying that uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? Well, there's no such thing as a free computer program. If you are using a program for free, be it Facebook, LinkedIn, any of the Google products, um, remember that there is a cost to running those programs. And if you are getting it for free, then you are the product. They are collecting your information. So specifically with regard to Facebook, I have backed away from Facebook in, in large amounts. Um, I'm on it as minimally as possible because they do a lot of information tracing, not only on Facebook, but when you go to another site, there are likely to be Facebook tags on the other site that will um, send your information back to Facebook. I, I personally, um, I don't like the company. I don't like the way that Facebook runs themselves. If they had been upfront and clear about the ways in which they aggregate data on all of us, I think then we could uh, have made a, a better um, decision about how to use the how to use their platform or use their service. And they just simply weren't. We, we know that Facebook got sued in 2012 by the FTC and we know that they lost and they were required to submit um, information to the FTC, which they really didn't. They were not in compliance all the way up to Cambridge Analytica. So when you use free platforms, uh, remember that they're, they're extracting some value of money from you, um, from your data. And it's probably cross platform. I use a, uh, a browser called Firefox. It's Mozilla Firefox and a, 
a web browser called DuckDuckGo, which has some, um, some protections built into it. And that's just the way that I choose to, to conduct my lives. I'm moving, uh, moving off of Google products just because they're the same thing. They're, they're free and they're integrated and they offer some great services. I just don't think that the, that what they're offering me is, um, something that is commensurate to the value of my data, my information. So, yeah, that's where I am on Facebook. It's a, for the time being, it's a necessary evil. Um, but certainly be mindful that everything you put on there from where you are, your locations, your information, pictures of your children, those are likely being scanned and correlated with other information and building a database on you. If you're, if you're okay with that and you're, you're fine with the value you get out of it, then I say go for it. Uh, personally, I'm not. So that's my position on Facebook and data aggregation. Right, we have a question from Barbara who is interested in uh, climate change. She would like to uh, learn how, uh, what are some of your approaches to fighting climate change and some legislation that you might be able to uh, introduce. Yeah, um, climate change is really something that is, uh, is near and dear to my heart. And um, I come from the, the science world, the science background. And what I have on, on my house is I have solar panels um, sufficient to power the house. We have an electric vehicle. So we're, we're doing what we can personally to, uh, to be um, as, as little reliant on traditional fossil fuels as possible. Um, what we could do really is we could engage the, the solar resources that we have in, in Arizona right now. I, I come from science, so I did the math on it. I calculated out the number of square feet that we would need if you'll allow me to... Uh, to nerd out for a second, the number of square feet of solar panels that we would need to power Arizona or the western half of the U.S. during the day. It's completely doable with a very small environmental impact and um, something that would, in, in daytime hours, lessen the need for being on traditional energy generation. Now, obviously, we either need a lot of batteries to power us at night or we need uh, wind or we need traditional power generation at night. So you have to be mindful of how the, the entire grid works together you can't just uh, you can't just go to solar straight away you have to integrate and make sure that we have redundancies um, but i think incentivizing all of us to be on hybrid or electric vehicles um, incentivizing all of us to use the rooftop space that we have to have solar panels that help to power either in part or in whole our homes it's a great way to go and what we need is the political will to incentivize um, those resources so that we can get uh, off of using fossil fuels. Now, there's a secondary component to, or, or I guess three components to this. We have water and then we have just the environmental waste that we have. Um, for issues like water, I, I do have a background in, uh, in water law and I've been coming on board more and more with Representative Engel to look at water law issues. I was not part of the the discussions last year about um, our Colorado River and how we're using those resources, but um, I've signed on to Representative Engel's bills and I'm becoming more of a player in that space. Um, and I've been working with some folks in, on recyclables. There's a, a great team out of uh, students out of ASU that's looking at recyclables. I had them up to the Capitol a couple times to talk about their um, their plans and their methodology for incentivizing counties or um, just a, a regional um, management to recycle and do it responsibly and recapture some of our waste so that we're not sending it off to the to the landfills. It's really unfortunate in Tucson that we we didn't hit our mark as far as clean uh, recycling such that they had to back down to once every two weeks for a recycling pickup. I've got my uh, I got a, a stack of cardboard that needs to go out to do that. So um, yeah, uh, heavily engaged in in the fight to make sure that we give our kids and our kids' kids a clean future. Um, and I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can do that. Uh, remember that a society grows great when old men and old women plant trees under whose shade they know they will never, never sit. And our, uh, our environment is literally planting that tree. We have to do it because uh, five years, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, that is uh, what our kids will be inheriting. All right. Um, you mentioned that one of your top issues was cleaning up government, and that ties in with a question that Amy has for you uh, concerning the outlaw dirty money campaign. 
Would you please tell us if you do or do not endorse the outlaw money, dirty money campaign and uh, why or why not? Yeah, no, I, I support um, outlaw dirty money. I've signed on to the petition. Um, we have to get a handle on the ways in which uh, political money is filtered into our capital. Now, I am a firm believer in our constitution and those two provisions I told you about, number one, that all political power comes from the citizens and it goes out with the consent of the citizens. And when you have um, large corporations that are filtering money to candidates to win elections, uh, that is not acceptable. That is not an acceptable way to go about a government because it is not transparent. We need to know who's putting money down, who believes in what, and, um, and, and really start getting our, our priorities to what the people want and not what corporations want. And I'm, um, I've signed on to the, the fossil fuels pledge, which ties back to the environment, but I was a supporter and I am a supporter of outlaw dirty money. I, uh, it's interesting to see what our corporation commission will be composed of, given that a couple of the Republican candidates are off of the ballot now. So there are some options now that we can jump into the race and um, maybe capture one or two seats on the Corporation Commission. That would be fantastic. Got another question from uh, Amy um, regarding electronic signature gathering, which of course is uh, something that's important to the Outlaw Dirty Money campaign. What's your position on making electronic signature gathering a possibility to put people's citizens' initiatives on the ballot? Yeah, that is a, a fascinating question. So um, I did my research on that. I went down the rabbit hole trying to figure out where it came from and how we got it. In, in what's, what fundamentally strikes me as kind of absurd is that a candidate can use the, the candidate portal to gather up signatures for a nomination petition, but that um, a, a petition like Outlaw Dirty Money um, can't. And I don't have any good logical reason why that is. I can I can say pretty firmly that the uh, Attorney General Brnovich, when he submitted his position that uh, that petition gatherers can't use um, online signatures, I think he's wrong. He's just flat wrong. There's no good reason for that. Just because it's not included specifically in our Constitution, because the Constitution was written 108 years ago, um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't adopt it and have it go forward now. Um, so yeah, the this is something that unfortunately that issue has been foreclosed, I believe, for this, um, this campaign season, but it's something that we're going to have to take up, and, and I would like to see a bill that clarifies that. Remember that listed in our Arizona Constitution, before you get to legislative powers, before you get to the powers of the legislature, it's specifically enumerated that um, the powers of the citizens are both for initiatives, where the, the citizens can gather up signatures, to bring their own bills to the voters or referendums. And referendums are, if the citizens don't like a bill that's passed, you can have a, a referendum on it to bring it to the voters to see if it should be, uh, to be stricken or taken out or modified in some way. So these, those are um, enumerated rights of Arizonans that come up before the legislature is even talked about. So I believe that those are our priority rights that the citizens hold that we need to take very seriously. Thanks. Just want to remind everybody we've got about 10 minutes left and if you would like to get a question in, uh, now's the time to do so. Just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and uh, I'll convey the message on to Domingo. So uh, Marion has a question uh, about the House uh, meeting tomorrow. Her question is, you know, do you think the House is going to allow new bills to be introduced in the session tomorrow? Another great question, and um, I, the answer is I don't know. The reason that I'm not sure is because of the process and procedure. We are we're outside the bounds of what you might call normal business in the legislature. So um, going from top down, what we have is that the the Senate has gone to and voted on what they call shiny die, which is we've finished our business, we're done for the legislative session. Um, the rules state pretty clearly that the House, one chamber can't shiny die without the other doing so um, within 72 hours. But the Senate went to shiny die, they voted on it, they passed it 26 to 4. And now the House is reconvening something like uh, 10 days later. 
So we're pretty far outside the rules. Um, what you're what you're looking at in the flow of the the House and Senate right now is we've gone through crossover week. There were when you submit a bill in the House of Representatives, it goes through its underlying committees, be that education or appropriations or whatever else. It goes to rules, and then it goes to the floor to be voted on by the entire body. If it passes out of the entire body, then on crossover, the House bills go to the Senate, and the Senate bills that have gone through the same process on their chamber go over to the House. So we've gone through crossover. The House bills that are in the Senate are theoretically dead because the Senate is not coming back to hear any bills, or so they say. The bills that are in the House, um, they're Senate bills, and they can theoretically be amended in committee to have any new language added to them. There's a, a theoretical amendment that you could have on the floor if the bill makes it to the floor of the, the House of Representatives. Um, but if the bill changes in any way, it would have to go back to the originating chamber. So if there are any, um, any amendments that happen in the House, then the bill would have to go back to the Senate, and the Senate would have to reconvene and hear that amendment. And if they agree to it, or if there's a conference committee, um, they would have to pass it as amended. And then the bill as amended would have to go to the governor for signature, which is a whole another step here. Um, a lot of moving parts. The, the guidance that we got from Speaker Bowers is that we're going to be in session and in committee hearings and floor Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and on Friday if there's any business, if we haven't gone to sine die uh, before that. I don't know. We are in a very strange time. The guidance is, uh, is pretty thin. Um, it appears the, on the Democratic side, we don't have any control because the, the majority, the Republicans, control what the schedule is going to be and, and how it goes. Um, what we can do is talk about our values and talk about what Arizonans need, but the Republicans are in control of the agenda. And uh, twice now, we've been called into session over the last probably three weeks. Twice that session has been canceled. So here we go. I'm, I've got my, uh, my suitcase packed and I'm ready to head up to the Capitol for, for tomorrow's session. So we'll see. All right. Got a question here from my friend Lee, who is uh, inquiring about how the Democrats are doing in registering voters this year compared to previous years. Uh, she thinks that uh, this is key to winning those two or three seats we need to gain in the state legislature. So how are our Democrats doing registering voters? Oh, I think we're doing fantastic. Thanks, Lee, for the question. I think we're doing fantastic. Um, as I'm talking to you, I'm trying to bring up a mental image of the, uh, the statistic that I saw that um, the split of, of voters now is, oh, and maybe Nick has this, I want to say it's like 1.3 or 4 million Republican, one point, maybe two and a half million uh, Democrats, maybe 1.1 million of um, of non their independence basically um i'd have to double check on that but there have been a lot more democrats registered just recently probably due um, in large part to the presidential preference election and those folks that were normally not of any registered party that um had to come on to one party or the other to vote or democratic party to, to vote um we're seeing that we don't know how many of them will stay on the democratic ticket or how many of them will go back to um, the independent ticket. But yeah, the, the numbers are, are turning out pretty well. And I, I believe that Arizona is, um, if not squarely blue, that it is purple. Um, just the, the representation that we have in the, in the house of representatives, 29, 31, that's a 49 to 51% split. And the numbers of reg registered voters that we have just out in the community shows that we are not a red state. We are a purple state. Um, so we need to make sure that our friends and neighbors get out to vote, that they know what the issues are and that they know who the candidates are. Um, I try to, to talk with everyone that, uh, that would like to chat with me. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't do any more face to face. I like when, in the old days when you could shake someone's hand and look them in the eye and talk to them about issues, but that is just not something that, that we can do under the current pandemic. So um, yeah, just reach out and, and let me know what I can do to help out with that. I'm happy to talk to folks and, and let them know what my values are. But I think we're looking good on the voter side. Question from uh, Christopher. Uh, he says, listening to you, you really think about issues and are willing to tell us when you are unsure. How do you combat Republicans who are totally incompetent 
and yet are far more sure of themselves than their knowledge should allow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so, so I have, a. In my, in my legal training, um, in my work in the courts, we had to do a lot of um, negotiation and, and compromise and mediation. And I, I went into the legislature almost two years ago with really high hopes of, of talking to folks and talking about issues and talking about facts and data and getting to the heart of, of a discussion. And what I found is that there are some uh, Republican legislators that they just believe a position. They just believe it they don't have any basis to believe it. They don't, they don't need or want a basis. They just believe it. And that is the end of that story. I had, um, I'd gone in with high hopes that I could uh, talk to folks and build coalitions, but there are some folks that you just, you're not going to be able to talk to. Um, that is, that's a little disappointing, but I, I suppose I should have, I should have figured that that was going to be the case. Um, However, there are a lot of folks that I've been able to build rapport with, and I've been able to build some good relationships across the aisle and, and talk about issues just as people, not as Democrat, Republican, just as people that um, we, all, we all want a safe place to live. We all want our kids to grow up in you know, a safe environment with good schools. We all want a, a stable job where we can reach for that American dream. There's a lot of things that we have in common, and you just have to uh, get to know folks so that the political rhetoric doesn't get in the way. Um, it's unfortunate there are a lot of really politically charged issues that are, uh, that are destroying our ability to, um, to talk about things and be civil. Um, I'll keep working on it. It's in my nature to be uh, both um, optimistic and hopeful and to really strive to work together, um, but you can only do as much as the other side is willing to, to work with you on. Right, great. We're down to our last few minutes. We have one question, and uh, Michael, I'm sorry we didn't have any time to get to it. But uh, Domingo, I wonder if you could show that slide again with your uh, contact information and tell us how uh, our, our uh, audience here can support you. And uh, Nick, if you have anything else to add, uh, this is your chance. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, so you should be seeing on your screen um, contact information for me. We have the, the website up at degrazia for arizona.com, F O R Arizona spelled out.com. You can also email me, domingo at degrazia for Arizona, or um, get us through uh, Twitter, or if you're on Facebook, um, get us there. And um, we do need support. We are in the middle of a campaign. I mean, we are like fired up right in the middle of it. So um, you can go through the website to Act Blue if you would like to donate. We also have uh, ways that you can volunteer and just do constituent outreach or help us with phone banking. There's a lot of ways to get involved and I will turn it over to Nick to follow up on the last bits for that. Yeah, I'll just pop up with my voice. Um, yeah, we definitely absolutely need the support. Um, unfortunately, we do still need to fundraise and we've been paused on that since. Domingo is starting to call a few people mostly for checking in, but if you are in a situation where you are not economically insecure right now, we would greatly appreciate anything you could give. And as far as volunteering, we are gonna be ramping up. We had a little hiccup with some of our check-in calls because uh, we actually decided to do a robocall uh, through uh, Representative Engel but we are getting ready to start doing some uh, campaign phone calls. And then we also, now that we're in this weird area where Arizona is reopening against the science saying we should, uh, we definitely wanna call and make sure that people understand that if they are still able to, they should stay home as much as possible. Uh, and so that's something that if you sign up for a volunteer list, you can do that on the website or I believe degraziaforarizona.com slash volunteer. Uh, you'll get all those emails from us about how to get involved. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, just to uh, to close it out on my side, thanks, Larry. Um, thanks, everybody, DGT, for uh, for tuning in. Feel free to reach out if you need anything or if you have any questions. Just uh, just reach out. We are we are hot and heavy in the middle of uh, getting back into legislation. I see that in the one hour that I've been um, chatting with you folks, that I've got uh, another twenty five messages that have popped up and. Um, so we're getting right back to it, but feel free to reach out. Let me know what you need. I'm, I'm happy to be of any help I can to, uh, to do some. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Domingo. It was uh, very interesting uh, listening to you and all the points that you covered. I wanna remind everybody that uh, you tune in every Monday at noon, uh, 
right on Zoom, and we have been presenting candidates, uh, Democratic candidates, for elected office for 40 years, and we plan to keep on doing that. And uh, always check the DGT website where we have lots of news stories and uh, events listed. And with that, uh, Domingo, I want to thank you very much for being with us today. I want to wish, wish you all the best luck in your campaign. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.